I have a hard time, like some people, I'm sure in the business do, something's brought to you and it's really excellent, you know, you have a tendency to want to keep it, but then the other side, the business side of you says, you know, you can't keep every, every, everything that you like, you know, because I mean, obviously what you like, more than likely to sell easily. All right, I got Jam Musial here today, and I had to pull teeth to get you here, didn't I, Jan? Well, a little uncomfortable for yeah, this Yeah, why guy. is that? Well, because uh, I'm not used to being in the limelight, I guess, you know, <laughs> people. You like to be under the radar? Correct. Yeah, yeah. I, and I know that's true because you have no phone. Right. You have no computer. That's true. But yeah. yet you've been in the Indian art business since 79? 1979, yeah. I started. Yeah, so. yeah I, but... Um, and that happened because of being a collector for years before. And um, as you probably know, Mark, the collectors begin to trade or, you know, uh, buy things from each other. And one day, back in early 79, I, I had a gentleman from Scottsdale buy like $9,000 from me. <laughs> and I said... I better make this a business. So uh -huh. I, went, I went and got a license. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so I want to know how you got started. there. So where'd you grow up? I grew up in Southern California, a place called Culver City. Yeah, of course. Culver City, California. That was just a little dink of a town then, wasn't it? It was back in the 40s and 50s. It was a wonderful place to grow up in, um, you know, in the Los Angeles area. Yeah, when it uh, was just... Southern California. And yeah, and the towns were separated, you know, pretty much by open space. We could, you know, ride our bicycles down to the beach, which was maybe three miles. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you just did it by yourself when you were nine, ten years old. Nobody yeah. didn't worry about it. <laughs> in Culver City, God, you <laughs> wouldn't do that now. Yeah, right. And so... And then did you... So you started... Um, your interest in Native American art started really early, right? It did. In the first time I became conscious of the fact that I was interested in, we call it Native American art Indian today. Art. Yeah, yeah, Indian, Indian art. art. Yeah. Well, we still call it that, right? Yeah. It was um, my sister, my cousin, and I on Saturdays would walk down to the library and, you know, spend the morning down there. And I would go over and find my section and they would go over to the Nancy Drew section or whatever. And one day, my cousin Joy came over, and I was between two rows of, you know, books 10 feet high, and I was sitting on the floor and, and looking through this book on Native American. And she says, it's time to go. And I said, how did you find me? Because I kind of thought I was hidden. Right. She says, you're always in the Indian section. And, that, <laughs> and that's when I was seven. There and that seven. brought it to my attention that I for whatever reason, gravitated towards Native American, you know, And did works. you go and look for arrowheads and that kind of thing at all? I did. That's a whole another story. That's part of the background is uh, I had an aunt and uncle that lived in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, on Easter and in Christmas holidays, we would often drive to see them. And they had two boys and, and uh, one of my cousins, Skipper, he and I both had the same interest, and uh, they lived on the fringes of Las Vegas at that time. Of course, it's probably downtown today. Right. But um, we would just pack a lunch and go out and look for arrowheads during the day or potsherds, you know. Yeah. And that was when we were, you know, seven, eight, nine years old. And um, it was great fun. You know, it was exciting to find a potsherd with a little bit of a design right. on it and that kind and of thing. And you could find it right in Vegas? Really? Yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, that just, amazing? yeah. We don't think about that being, you know, having yeah. any kind of native right. history, but it's it was everywhere in the Southwest. It was, in the West, really. yeah, it was. And my dad and my uncle were nice enough to take the two of us um, over to Kingman so we could see real Indians, you know. Right. And we'd camp out in Peach Springs and places like that. What years was this? Was this this in the was 40s? in 51, 51, 52, 53. I bought my first pot in 52 or 3 when I was 9, 10 years old uh -huh. 
from a Tomahawk Trading Post, which was over there somewhere on a little knoll, as I remember it. And um, Where was that? I've never heard of that one. Is that in Arizona? It was in Nevada. Oh, it was in Nevada. Yeah, somewhere between Los Angeles and Nevada, and right. my dad would stop there for me. And um, I bought a Santa Clara piece for a buck sixty-five. <laughs> Do you remember and who made it, or probably was unsigned? No, I don't. Yeah. I don't remember who. I still have it, uh, and um, I have my first uh-huh. two pots. I have my first pot too. Santa yeah. Clara, about this big, a little, uh-huh. a little bird that I yeah. bought when I was about seven. And so uh, then a year later, at the same place, I bought my first painting, which that would have been nineteen. 19- 54 and I would have been about 11 and what oh, that and one, that was, was that? a it was a Fred Cabote single figured painting and it as I remember it was like $17 it was and was huge for like a 10 year old in that time yeah I used to get 50 cents allowance for mowing the lawn taking yeah. out the trash doing the dishes that kind of thing that's pretty and, good actually and at and that I, time that's what I, I got in the <laughs> 60s and I would save that and I think I had like $9 and my dad said, if you really want it, I'll make the difference, and then you work it off. So for the next four or five months, man, I washed cars, waxed cars, mowed neighbors' lawns, uh-huh. did everything to pay that off for that Kabote. And that was, you know, like I say, 1954. And did that, was that a new painting he had done recently? Yeah, that was And where did current. you buy that? Do you remember? Well, yeah, it was same the Tomah- place? Yeah, the Tomahawk place. Trading Post. And now tell me, I got to know, is, do you still have that <laughs> painting? No, actually, um, when I got married, um, I'm trying to think of the year it might have been, we got robbed. And Uh. for whatever reason, we were living in an apartment, and the people that did that um, took our clothes and and everything. I mean, silverware, pots and pans, took just about the whole apartment. Right. And I had a coin collection, and I had that in the bedroom, and... They took those, of course. You look so, every. Do you go every show that you go to? Do you go <laughs> look for that Cavote? No, I've had it in the back of my mind because um, a friend of mine lost a really nice Gerald Naylor, and I always have those two yeah. paintings if they show up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. And what so, year was that that you lost it? Um, it would have been. Well, it was after the active service, probably about sixty. Five, yeah, thereabouts. All right, yeah. so if anybody's out there that bought a Kubota <laughs> around 65 or 66, let us know. Yeah, right. We'd like to get it back. Exactly. So you grew up the whole time in Culver City. You graduated did, high school there, too? Correct, Culver High. And did, were you so. interested in the arts? Did you do anything? Like, were you painting, drawing, anything like that at all? Well, I think my interest in art came from my father. My father could do anything with a paintbrush, and he sold paint for a living. And, like uh, house paint? House paint, uh-huh. correct. And that's, and, what he, and, he, that's what his job was, to sell house paint? Yeah, he had his own shop there yeah. in Culver City on Sepulveda Boulevard. And um, he also was very interested in art, and he drew, he could do pinstriping. Like when mm. I was a teenager, he did pinstriping on my car for me and my, my friends. He would do, you know, flame work on a gas tank for a motorcycle, that kind yeah. of stuff. And he attended classes, night classes, art classes. And when I was real little, you know, probably six, seven, um, I would go with him and I would sit at his feet and he would paint, you know, from a live model. And um, I would play with his pastels and stuff like that. And I think that's how I might have been spurred to be interested in color and art. Uh And so you think he was an an artist that just didn't ever get the opportunity to become like a fine artist, is that was that his? Journey, yeah, he you think? did. He, no, he did it for pleasure. You know, Just it was pleasure. his hobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he enjoyed doing it. It was a way of unwinding, I'm sure, from his business and the stress of other things. Right. And did so when you left for college, did you have an <laughs> idea what you wanted to do? Well, what I wanted to do yeah. and what my brain would let me do was okay. two different things. And what I, was that? Well, I thought, you know, anthropology or archaeology, but I didn't have, really didn't have the smarts for that. So um, I went into agriculture, and I, and that was after active duty service. Now, let's talk about that. So you're 18. You went immediately into the so you, service. So you graduate high school. This is uh, what year? Uh, 61. Okay. And I was in the Navy from 61 to 67. 
That's a uh, long time. And why did it, why did well, you decide? Well, I was a reserve, and I had two years active. I see. And why did uh-huh. you why did you decide you wanted to go into the service? Um, well, that's kind of a tough question to answer. You know, it was a it was a tough time for our family. There was, you know, personal issues. I see. So uh, there was some yeah. things that drove you from yeah to just to get away. Got it. Yeah. It was. Yeah. So. The last part of your high school was rougher than maybe. It was, yeah, it was pretty tough. It was, and I made it tough probably for my parents too. Yeah. So, so they were, you you were looking for an out, and they were okay with you get going to the. Oh, neighbor. my dad signed me into the reserves when I was sixteen. I turned seventeen <laughs> in boot in boot camp. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah. Where yeah. was that? Where was boot San camp? Diego? Yeah. San Diego, yeah. And then that I had toughen you up, won't it? yeah. Then I had well, it grew. You grew up. You yeah. learn to be responsible for yourself. Yeah, that was the big thing. No more excuses. You know, I didn't do it, or your sister right. did it, or whatever. They don't take that kind of stuff. Uh, you no, know? I was a naval doctor. I don't know if you even <laughs> knew that, but I was in oh, the no, navy for I didn't nine either. years. Yeah, oh. four active and five yeah, well, then reserve. You, yeah, uh huh. Yeah. yeah, well, then you know. And I spent my time in the Pacific. Um, I was during that time when they had the Bay of Pigs. You know, then in uh, Cuba, and so we were, you know, stationed on on the Pacific side of the Panama Canal, just sitting there for almost sixty days. Did you know what was going on? Did you have a clue? Um, they kind of told us a few things, but of course, you didn't have the communications that you have today. So, and being so young, you know, I just did what I was told. To All right. Do. What were you? So, what was your? Job? I was a yeoman. Yeah. Yeah, I was a yeoman, and. Um, you know, I spent time from the Panama Canal in the service up to the Aleutian Islands in Siberia. Um, and that was when the Cold War was going. Right. And they patrolled, you know, a certain boundary between Siberia and Alaska. And you had to keep your guns at 30 degrees or whatever it was. And mm-hmm. you were you were at uh, GQ 24-7. It was terrible. You know, 50 below zero for yeah. weeks at wow. a time. Yeah, it wasn't GQ. By the way, is general quarters for those. Guys. Yeah, and it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't good duty up there. <laughs> it, was, it was nice to get down. And you, you were know, there by, for how many active years? You were there for two active or f- two two years active in the in the. And Pacific. during that time, were you still thinking about native arts, Indian art stuff? Well, it left me, you know, when when girls came along okay. in my mind and and uh, the service. Yeah, it left me. No, I wasn't. I kind of put it on the back burner. It didn't come back until, you know, maybe mid '60s is when it started yeah. to. Yeah. So, come so back. you do two years active duty, and that's through what '64. So? I got uh, was from uh, June of '61 to July of '63 yeah. active duty. But and you do then, reserve, and, and you then do it I right d- through the Vietnam War, right? Right. They called me back and uh, said they needed yeoman and i said well you know i just got married and much to my surprise the guy just signed off the paper and said okay you we don't need you right i walked out of there thanking the lord <laughs> up above that i didn't have to go to now yeah because yeah. uh you know i if i would have answered it the wrong way i guess i would have been on board again right yeah. so four years you you did the reserve is that yeah. right yeah yeah, but you didn't have to go do Vietnam. No. Yeah, you were fortunate. You were fortunate. I was. Yeah, because I'm very, sure a lot of your friends, or at least your. Oh yeah, I lost the, two of my friends that yeah. I went to high school with. They, they went into the army. Yeah. yeah what they, was that like? They, they to didn't lose come friends home. so yeah. Does that affect you? You think? Um, no, I was kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, calloused from my background, God. and uh, I didn't get too emotional so when you, somebody you, was you lost. Had, you had learned how to deal with your emotions or at an early age, it sounds I like. Did. Yeah, yeah, I did. I got it. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, um, you know, from there, got married. I worked for the airlines, United Airlines, for a couple of years. Uh-huh. What did you do? And uh, worked in the in the tools uh-huh. supply in, uh, there at LAX. And then... Um, I became a fireman for L.A. County. I didn't know that. Yeah, I was, uh-huh. a, I was a fireman for 30 years. Oh, my gosh. From 60, 69 to 99. Wow. And, um, you know, that's a whole other so- story there. 
Uh, I want to hear know, that story. Do you really? I, absolutely. Uh, well, my first wife and I waited quite a while. I, we'd, I was 27 when we had our daughter. And um, my wife was one of the few women that didn't like being a mother. And mm. um, within a short time, I'll kind of fast forward, but it was short time since he was maybe six years old. Her mother left, and I got 100% custody of my daughter, which was very unusual for a man right. in 19, I think, 72 or whatever that right. would be. And um, I, had, I had already built a home in Flagstaff, and I, my plan was to go over there, but again, my ex didn't want to do that. And was that and the native thing that was pulling you to Flagstaff? Yes, absolutely. And... Um, then when I got custody of my daughter, it's a lot of responsibility. I had, I can't remember how many years I had in the, uh, on the department, but I thought, you know, I've got a good job, and my mother and my sister were willing to help me because you work 24-hour shifts. So they were willing to help me, you know, raise my daughter. Right, because they're still in Culver City, yeah. or your mom was. Right, mom, yeah. mom and uh, my sister, they were both in the teaching field for the schools. And um, so I was kind of mandated to stay in Southern California, even though I had a home. And I started a business, as I say, in 79. And um, because I you know, had that, I guess, type A personality mm -hmm. where you're just go, go, go all the time, I um, started that business and I would drive over and sometimes my daughter would come with me and we'd go out on the res every, almost every month. And so how uh, long had you been a fireman that you decided, okay, I'm going to start doing buying and selling? Well, I was 30 years as a fireman and 23 of it. I went back and forth to the res, to the res and into Flagstaff. I, I started to do shows and at one time, I did 11 shows a year, uh -huh. which is almost one a and month. Th this was for contemporary stuff primarily, right? Correct. I never got into the older stuff. Right. I, uh, I just felt I didn't need to do that. Yeah, you know? and what was it about the new stuff, the living artists that really well, drew I, you in versus the old stuff? Because for most people, it's kind of... The old stuff. A lot of people, you know, right. start with the new and go to the old, but right. you're there's not. Two, there's two things, Mark, that I you know, kind of shoot myself in the foot for it. One is, I don't deal in much jewelry, yes. which is the biggest part of the whole business, right. especially with Navajos. And I never um, uh, went into the old stuff. I mean, if old baskets came to me, fine. Yeah. But I stayed away from, you know, religious items. You know, I could have easily bought masks back in the 70s and yeah. whatnot. And I just didn't want to handle that. And part of that was my second wife was Navajo. Yeah. And so we were married for about 10 years. And um, that was another reason why I stayed away from the old stuff. And where did you super, meet her? I met her out in Gray Mountain. Yeah. And then she happened to work in Flagstaff. Uh -huh. And so, you know, we picked up a relationship. And were you still so, doing the fireman thing at that oh, point? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you meet this wonderful Navajo girl. Exactly. And, um, you know, I had a balancing act for those 23 years, of which I was married a second time for 10 or 11 of those yeah. years. You know? So what's the cultural so, differences being married to a huge. girl? Yeah, what are they? Well, I mean, I write these murder mysteries, and that's part of my oh, is thing. That right? is, yeah, you'll have to read one. Actually, I'll give you one, but well, uh, you know uh, better than anybody. No. Well, um, yeah, you do. <laughs> it's just, number one, some of the cultural differences, you know, what you have is is pretty much accepted as theirs. And so, you know, if you have money and they need a car battery or four tires, then, you know, you have more than they do, so you get those four tires right. for them, that kind of thing. And then there's the religious things and superstitious things that enter into it, um, which sometimes, you know, as an Anglo, you just kind of shrug your shoulders like, you know, right. what are we doing here? Yeah. But, you know, other parts of it but is... But she was very, very serious nice. about being... She was a traditional Navajo? She was definitely caught between. She spoke fluently, 
She grew up with her grandmother because her parents were alcoholics. Then she was fostered out to a Mormon family in mm-hmm. Utah. And for the first time when she was, I don't know, maybe nine or ten, she had running water, could take showers. I mean, it was a huge shock mm-hmm. to her compared to living with her grandmother as a, as a child and an infant. And then she learned the Anglo way and, you know, my, uh, transformed herself into, you know, working in an in a Anglo environment and so forth, but would go home, you know, for different things or to see a medicine man. Yeah, you know, that was part of her program. Yeah. Yeah. And then her daughter, she had when I met her, um, she was like the last link. Her mother could hardly speak English. And then my wife was in between, could speak English and fluent Navajo. Her daughter spoke no Navajo Mm. and went to Anglo schools and really did not like going out you know, to see your grandparents or anything on the mm-hmm. res. It was, you know. Has that changed for her, that child? I have no idea. Yeah. You know, we divorced back 27 years ago, yeah, so, so I don't know. Yeah, ago. I would know. But um, but it gave you a respect for the people that probably a few people have. I don't right. understand. And it also lets you kind of have a window and look at the culture. And when people say, you know, you often hear that Native American culture is is dying, you know, and language certainly is, Mm. you know. Um, The younger people, you know, they want everything that the younger Anglos, you know, they want cell phones, smartphones. They want a, you know, 150 Ford pickup truck. They want, you know, the music. They want, they don't, you know, want to live like grandma and grandpa do. Yeah, yeah, that's hard. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, sheep herding and things like that are very difficult. But they, but they have that in their core, you know. Yeah. I mean, they, they always. I've never seen a Navajo that doesn't feel good to go back to the res. Yeah, and they know? have a great respect for their yeah. elders, unlike I right. think a lot of cultures. Right. So, so seven. That's it. So when you're doing this as a f- fireman, and seven years in, you go, "I'm going to start a business." What was it that said? What was that that made you want to do that business? What was there? Well, as I said, that gentleman came over. He was a gallery owner in Scottsdale on Main Street. And um, You want to say his name? Do you know who it is? Or do you not want to? No, I'd rather not. Okay, but, got it. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he's not around anymore. He moved up to Jackson and had a business up there for years. Uh, I think he and his brother. And uh, So he was buying your collection? He, 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 he was collected. buying... Well, at that time, I was picking up things that other people wanted. You know, I would find a collector that say, hey... You know, keep your eye out for Got a it. medicine man, you know, uh, such and such basket or a spider woman basket yeah, or something like that. A and wedding I'd basket find, kind yeah, of thing. and I'd find it and I'd say, Is this what you want? You know, and he'd buy it. And that's kind of the way it developed. And so I had called on him um, once or twice down in Scottsdale. <clears throat> and he says, Well, I'm coming up to Flagstaff. Let me just see all of what you have. You know, you can't bring it all down here. I said, sure, come by. And you had built a house by that time? Uh, yeah. I was yeah. in I had my own I had built a log home. But still there. going back and forth. Oh, to absolutely, LA. Yeah. yeah. Just actually just starting. You know, I mean, little did I realize I'd be doing it till nineteen ninety nine, you know, <laughs> back in seventy nine, tw- another twenty years. Right. And um so yeah, I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. What I did driving back and forth, five hundred miles each yeah. way. And Your then, heart was in flag, but you needed to make the money. And yeah, and then my, in my responsibility of having my yeah, daughter, raise right. my daughter, and then that softened a bit when my daughter um, became junior high. I put her in a five-day boarding school in. Um, it was called Flint Ridge La Canada. It's right above the Rose Bowl there in Pasadena. Uh-huh. And um, she was a five-day boarding student. And then if I wasn't available on Saturday or Sunday, as I said, my mom and my sister right. would pitch in for me. So, But normally, I would do my best to be off those days. I have to ask you this question because so, I have no idea. I've never talked to a real fire person. What's that like to be a fireman? What's it like to be a fireman? Yeah, I mean, well, I, mean I going just looked into, at it as a job. Well, yeah, but I you're mean, going into it, you places had, people don't want to go. Well, that's, buildings. that's true, but that's a small part of it. Just when I came on, in, in fact, L.A. County just recently um, 
celebrated his 50th anniversary with the paramedic program. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I came on, the medical end of it was just getting started. And little by little, that grew more and more. Mm -hmm. And the firemen today, um, I would say in most communities, the medical end of is the, the fire bigger part. is at least 85%. Yeah. You know, the burning buildings or the car fires, that kind of thing, are secondary. It, almost all the departments have built, you know, an empire right. around the medical thing. Yeah. Yeah. But did you enjoy that whole process? Oh, I loved my job. It was wonderful. And you work with, as a rule, you work with wonderful men. And um, they have a lot in common. I mean, you know, it's kind of a brotherhood, so mm -hmm. to speak. And um, I mean, obviously, if if you, uh, you're a doctor, if you line 10 doctors up, there's going to be some similarities right. in your, your thinking, both per, you know, professionally and personally. Sure. And it's the same thing with, you know, police, sheriffs, and, and firemen. Right. And so most of us, because we only work 10 days a month, um, 10, 24 hour days, um, had secondary jobs. Um, for 15 years, I built uh, a house, a spec house every other year. So I built seven, <laughs> seven houses in 15 years. I did, and did the Indian material. Did the Indian material. I wrote a book on Navajo pottery back in 82, 83, somewhere in there with uh, another fellow, a friend of mine, Russ Hartman. Is that book still around where they can get it? Um, on the secondary market, uh -huh. it's out of print, yeah. What drove you to do that? Why? why because Navajo pottery? Navajo pottery wasn't getting any attention. You know, I mean, it was all Pueblo, Pueblo, Pueblo. And um, as a, for whatever reason, I gravitated towards the Southwest, you know, when Navajo in particular, um, although I liked, you know, Pima and Hopi stuff. I was very eclectic at the beginning. Uh, my collection was all over the board. Mm -hmm. And then when I got divorced in 92... That was a second, second marriage. Sec yeah. second marriage. Yeah. Um, of course, you have to split things up. And I kept the home that I, that I had built in 1980. And by the way, that's a Hogan-shaped home. The, the core part of it is a Hogan. Right, I've been to that house, actually. It, it, it's about 12... Uh, Twelve to 1,400 square yeah, feet, the, the Hogan. And then there's two wings that go out for the bedrooms and, yeah. and, and guest rooms and so forth. But um, I was, it was winter time, and um, I was sitting in the living room looking at a lot of empty spaces on the wall and whatnot and what was left. <laughs> and, and I thought to myself, you know, I should get more of a focus, I think, you know, and I, what do I like best? And, you know, I had Hopi baskets, I had Pima baskets, I had, I had some Pueblo pottery, you know, uh -huh. I, I had rugs and I had, you know, different things. I didn't have anything in California, but it was all Southwest stuff. Um, Apache things were in there. So I, at that time, that night, I decided that from that point on, I was going to collect Navajo, and I was going to cull the collection because of the circumstances. It, it just flowed. And you, so, I, you do know. Do you think I there was anything there when, you know, you're losing your Navajo wife, and this is, she's taking this thing? And do you think that was a, some kind of a connection to her in some odd way, maybe? Perhaps, yeah, I perhaps. I, uh, I really haven't thought about it like that. But it was just... Well, you had this epiphany. She leaves, it's all gone, and you have this epiphany. You just want to deal right. in Navajo material. It, it, one of the things that bothered me about her is she looked at what I was doing as, as money transactions, where I, for, you know, what you would think would be the opposite, but I enjoyed mostly knowing, you know, the Alice Kling that made that pot. Right. Or... Mayes Black that made that basket. I liked going to her home and sitting there talking for, you know, 20 minutes or whatever before we decided to do business and yeah. things like that. You love the artist. Uh, yeah, I really did. And, and still I still do. do. Yeah, I was going to say, and you still do. Yeah, I think um, conservatively, I probably uh, to this day 
between 30 and 36 people that I supplement their income by buying, you know, pottery, beadwork, whatever they make. Mm -hmm. you and know. it's still all pretty much Navajo? Oh, it's all Navajo, yeah. yeah. And it's so, all, yeah. but you stick on pottery for some reason, and it was... Well, it, pottery, was but my passion developed into early Navajo artist paintings. Yeah. That's what I like yes. personally to collect. Um, that Dorothy Dunn School and the, the five guys, Ian Naylor, Hasso Day, Andy Senegini, uh, Quincy Tacoma, and uh, Harrison Begay. You know, those guys, you know, I always have my eye open for the, way, for the Quincy Tacoma in the booth, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> okay, well, I'll have to come over <laughs> yeah, and take well, a peek. Yeah, you didn't see it, but it was, it yeah. was there, a big one, actually. Oh, okay, I'll take a peek. Yeah, see, there you go. See, so, you're never not interested in it. So you fell in love with those artists. And did you get to know all those artists? I knew Andy. I knew Harrison had come over to the house many times. I bought from him. Um, Quincy had passed away. Gerald Naylor passed away in 52. Mm -hmm. um, and then Hustle Day, I did business with until he died in 98. And um, I met him, Hustle Day, right. which is Narcissa Abeda. Right, which um, is Tony Abeda's dad. Correct. Um, that's kind of a funny story. I met him on the streets of Gallup. I think I was on Second Street. Excuse me, he had mm -hmm. a couple paintings under his hand, under his arm. And um, I had bought from him I th just once before, I believe. But he, we both recognized each other. And I said, where, you know, what do you got there, you know? And so we were talking. This probably, I'm trying to think of how early this was. But um, it must have been like 77 or 78, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Um, he pulled them out and I said, well, I'll take that one there. And so we were talking and I noticed he was kind of looking over my shoulder. I was looking towards him, towards the building. And I turned around and there was these two young Navajo kids playing in the alley, um, across the street. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, do you know those kids, you know? And he says, one of those are, you know, that one with the black hair is my boy. Of course, they both had black hair. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, was, I saw Tony from, I don't know, um, 100 yards or 50 yards away, you know, right. for the first time. Of course, I didn't meet him at that time. But And so, um, yeah, I continued to buy from um, Narcissa until he passed away in 98 when he, let's see, it was 1998. Did he ever talk to you about code talking? Because he was a code talker. No, I never talked to him about that. I didn't talk too much about personal stuff. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> so, and do you think that's so, partly because you've, you lived intimately with a Navajo woman that you know to keep your boundaries when it comes to that kind of stuff? Um, or is that just you? I, th I think both. Yeah, yeah. You, you you if you're somewhat alert you pick up on it you mm -hmm. know that it, they don't care to talk about certain things right you know so and you just leave it alone and so Some, mm -hmm. sometimes as an anglo i find myself like stepping over the, the bounds which i shouldn't do you know i like if if i become conscious of it i quickly yeah i was going to say but you recognize it that's yeah. the key that's yeah. the key of, right. of having some cultural sensitivity i think is yeah. realizing oh this is not probably appropriate just because it seems appropriate to me but maybe right. not to them exactly and so did you get to develop a relationship with, i know you know tony beta really well but mm -hmm. did it did it come through that relationship with his father or did that come later on it came a bit later on yes. yeah and um Tony and Tony is an easy guy to become acquainted. Anybody who knows him yeah. automatically calls him their friend. I don't yeah. know how many people come to my home and say, "Oh, for, he's my friend." You know, Tony Bate <laughs> is my friend, and I think, "Yeah, right." The whole right. world is Tony's friend. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're friends, Tony. I hope. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, he's a very gregarious young man and talented too. And, talented and um, very intelligent. Highly. Yeah, and as so, I've told many people in the business, as we even discuss, I think he's got the best eye in the business. Oh, he does. Yeah, yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah, he just he, sees he quality and gets it right. instantaneously. I agree. <laughs> so, so um, 
that's about it, Mark. I oh, that's not even close to about is, it. What no, else? No, we're, we're, we're just getting going. Okay. Yeah. So what else? So you start collecting these native artists, the, the Harrison Begay and uh-huh. and all these individuals. Yeah. And and that was more to keep for yourself as a collector, or did you? No. They were still to buy and sell. I think. Buy and sell, although I have a hard time. I know I, you do. Some people. I'm sure in the business do something's brought to you and it's really excellent. You right. know, you have a tendency to want to keep it. Right. But then the other side, the business side of you says, you know, you can't keep every, right. <laughs> everything that you like, you know, cause I mean, obviously what you like more than likely will sell easily. Right. And that, know? and so what was Harrison Begay like? Cause I've, I, I met well, him I once, met, but, oh, well, but he was once. older. I don't know how old, uh, you know, I'd have to think backwards, uh, cause he died in 2000. I think it was August 12, 2012. He died. And he was, somebody told me he was like 90 something. Yeah, he was, I forget. Yeah. I, cause it was conflicting when he was born, 1917 or right. somewhere along in there. But, um, he was a quiet person. Um, because I had a Navajo wife that made him feel good to paint in our home and stuff, you know, at the coffee table or not the coffee table, the kitchen. So he'd come to your house and actually paint. Yeah. Sometimes he finished paintings at the house and I'd buy them, you know, you know, and I'd work outside while he was doing that. And, uh, Robert Draper, he Uh used to do the same thing in Biet and Yaz, the three of them. And, um, I could never talk Harrison into doing a mural for me in the house because some of my rooms in the house around the windows, I made areas um, for them to do paintings on the wall. Mm-hmm. And um, Biet Niaz did that, and uh, um, Al Bahi's done that. Uh, Bahi Whitethorn, I've got these murals in each room, mm-hmm. you know, and David Bradley, who's not Navajo, but a dear friend. Um, he did one in my daughter's room for me. So, and then our good friend, Tony always said he was going to do one, uh-huh. but he's, <laughs> he never <laughs> made the time. <laughs> you, you may not be able to afford a Tony Abeda mural. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you know, I, I, at, when I asked him to do it, yeah. Um, was it was, I was buying paintings from him for 300 to five, six hundred dollars <laughs> So th- times have changed and it's too late, I, I would say. Plus, plus he, his plate is full. I wouldn't even ask him yeah, today yeah. because he's got, you know, many irons in the fire and he doesn't need to be thinking about doing one in my place. And what was so, it that you, when you built this house, you built it in a Hogan shape mm-hmm. and you built areas where you knew you wanted to have paintings actually put on the walls, fresco style. Right. And what was that? Why, why was that? Do you think that you needed that connection like that? That's really, I never, I never thought about it. Um, Chanto Begay asked me when he did the one in the dining room, um, he, he was the only one that asked me like why I wanted to do that. And I said, well, it, it just looks nice. I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy it for the rest of my life sitting here. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's, was my answer. And do you think that's part of it? I mean, you go, this is a house I'm going to die in. I'm going to stay here forever, and I always will be surrounded by beauty. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way. That's the way I look. I have approximately 125 to 140 paintings hanging in the house. Yeah. And um, they're they're hung in the studio style. And um, most paintings I can look at, and there's a story to, to me acquiring them. Even the deceased artist you know mm-hmm. I, I wished with all my heart i could have met uh gerald naylor mm. i um i really enjoy his paintings it's because his paintings speak so much to you yes yeah i really like his work and so and he had such a short life tragically yeah, yeah. and so, so you started this business in 79 mm-hmm. and you st- sold mainly to you did shows right shows that i would... did shows and that's how i met Wholesale customers. Yeah. I always have been in wholesale. The only, the closest I get to retail are the two shows here in Santa Fe where I do the objects of art and the antique Indian show. Mm-hmm. That's the only connection to re- retail that right. I ever and have. So who do you sell to? What kind of trading posts? Uh, I, Santa Fe well, stores? Y- yeah, over a period of these years, right. I certainly have um, 
done a lot with the park service gift shops, museum gift shops, and some galleries, you know, that obviously are interested in having Navajo things. Right. You know, paintings are a hard sell, but pottery or baskets and, of course, rugs are less so. And then if I was in jewelry, you know, that opens up all kinds of doors. But I, as I say, I kind of backed away from jewelry. And the reason I backed away from jewelry is back in the early 70s, um, I don't know if you were around oh, yeah. in the business. I mean, wasn't in the business. Well, I was, I was making so-called jewelry to help sell, you know, like when I was mm-hmm. uh, 12 and 13, 14, oh, yeah. I well, remember the days of how it was just exploded. Yeah, it, it exploded. And I personally knew people on the fire department that their relatives were in their garage making Indian jewelry. Yeah. And um, then I learned by doing different shows that some of the turquoise you're looking at isn't turquoise, right. you know? And I never wanted to be in a position to have bought something in good faith because sometimes the Native American will sell you this stuff mm-hmm. and say they made it or their father made it or whatever, a relative... And then you take it and you give it and sell it, you know, under the assumption that it's legitimate. Right. And then five years later, that person takes it to an expert at a museum opening or something. You know, what do they call those? Uh, appraisal where they days. Appra- yeah. Appraisal day. And the guy looks at it and he goes, oh, well, this is plastic and, you yeah. know, this is not right, right silver or whatever. Right. I never wanted to put my name behind stuff unless I really, really knew right. the person. Yeah. And so I do deal with a half a dozen jewelers, you know, and that's about it. And right. it's because I've known them for Forever. a long, long, yeah. long time. And you know what you're getting. And yeah. yeah. And that's about it. And so how have you seen this business change? You've been in it as long as anyone. Uh-huh. And how has it changed over the years? Well, I was fortunate there in the 70s to be... Um, to be able to go out on the res and actually go to a trading post. They were still real trading posts mm-hmm. on the res in the 70s, early 70s. And slowly but surely, they closed. Um, and it, it's somewhat complex. The, the, they closed because of the Navajo tribe. Instead of giving them 25 or 50-year leases, they wanted 10-year leases mm-hmm. or f- even five years, I heard. Well... A person with a five-year lease, he's not going to put any money in a building that right. he might have not get renewed. Yeah, because they own and, the building. The tribe right. owns the building. And then also, I can't remember exactly the time, but it certainly was by the early 80s, I think, the federal government, and I don't know all the particulars, said that the traders couldn't take pawn anymore. Right. And so the pawn shops were off reservation, which caused the Indians to circumnavigate the the traders. Mm -hmm. That was another nail in the coffin for the trading posts. So, um, but I was fortunate enough to get acquainted and become friends with um, a number of families that own multiple trading posts like Shanto and Ojato and Carson and and, uh, Kayenta. All these trading posts were owned by family members, you know. And Inscription House was another one. And um, so often, for me, they would put things aside knowing that I would take them when I came out, you know, four weeks later or whatever Mm -hmm. it was. And so they helped build my business in a big way, Mm -hmm. having friends on the res. And so then, um, after the turquoise and, and the jewelry thing died down, there was somewhat of a lull, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. there was a recession, so to speak, in the, in the Indian uh, art business. And um, I had an old timer tell me that it, it would, went in si- seven year cycles. Mm-hmm. It would go up mm-hmm. and it would level off for seven years and go down. And I don't know if that's quite true, but there is definitely um, cycles. Cy- yeah, yeah. It, there's definitely cycles to it. And of course, this last recession we had um, really changed the environment overall for most um, Native American business dealers. You know, many of them 
that I used to call on down in Tucson closed, even though they were, I think, third generation. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that happened all over. Yeah. You know, you don't see in Los Angeles, there used to be probably a dozen Indian shops. I don't think other, other than the Autry Museum that took the Southwest in, in their gift shop, they have Native American jewelry and a few Native American things. Um, I don't think there's a Indian shop in Maybe I'm wrong, but and in these are, and a lot of these shops you used to call on for years. Yeah, decades. for a number of years. Yeah. yeah, there used to be one in Ojai. There was one in Arcadia. There was one down at the Ports of Call, even Foster's. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the and 209 think, kind of wiped them all out. Um, yeah, and and plus, many of them got older and they didn't have somebody to pass their business on to, you know, mm-hmm. family member wasn't interested. That was another thing that closed them, closed up businesses. And today, you know, after that, I think that recession was kind of a wake up call to a lot of collectors who were maybe in their late sixties or mm-hmm. early seventy because they pulled back from buying during the recession. Right. And then, those years, literally years of the recession, gave them time to think about what they were doing and what they were accumulating mm-hmm. and how old they were getting to be. And then they found out that their daughter and son or their you know, children, um, family members in general, didn't want what they were collecting. And, and before, they had never thought about it, I think. Mm-hmm. And so that realization caused them like to be very cautious when things got better, like in what would have been maybe 2013, 14, when things started getting better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it took a long time. I mean, baskets took a dive, you know, rugs took a terrible hit and everything but jewelry. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Which I was not in. (laughs) But have you seen that come back? I mean, I, Oh yeah. 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 Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's come back. And, of course, the old adage, if you have something good and it's a good price, you're going to sell it. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. There's no problem there. It's all that, you know, the mediocre stuff that either has to be price rised or you just have to find the right person. What do you think your legacy is for this business? You oh, know? my gosh. I know it's a hard question. I've never it even is. asked that question, but I think it's important to ask you that question. You know, um, I, I don't think I can answer it, Mark. Um, my my feeling is I've seen it so many times where dealers um, just disappear, you know, because of health reasons or mm-hmm. whatnot. And a few people, old timers, talk about, well, you know, how so and so he's not making it, you know, health wise, he's not doing the shows anymore, and they mm-hmm. just kind of fade away. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know what the legacy would be. <laughs> well, you've got a book, you know, and you got a house. Yeah. with some great paintings that are painted into the house. Yeah, that's true. But so that's part. Uh, that could uh, be part. Yeah. And part, how mean, about all the native artists that you've supported for the last fifty years? That's a pretty damn good legacy, I would think. You think so? I do. Uh, I know they. I've never I, thought of it. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, and you're still supporting them, right? Yeah, like I say, I think somewhere between you know thirty and a three dozen. Yeah. I probably do on a regular basis. I supplement yeah. their income. Yeah, I think that's the legacy. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I, I'll accept that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, but I've never thought about it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think you're a special p- person. I'm glad you're in our business. I'm glad you've done what you've done. Well, thank and, you very uh, much. I'm going to let you get back to going and trying to make some sales because <laughs> I'm stealing you and <laughs> okay. in a prime time in Santa Fe. But well, it was wonderful talking to yeah. you, and, and See, you put me at ease. See, I told you it wasn't bad, right? Uh, right. Yeah, Absolutely. That was fun. I didn't you go did. there to all those places you didn't want to go to. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Jan, wonderful yeah. knowing you. Ditto. You're a great human being. Ditto. Jan Musel. Thank you. And if you're in Santa Fe, go see it. How can they get a hold of you? Is there a way they, or do they have to just go to other stores that sell your material? Well, they can always come by. Um, you know, I'm in Flagstaff. I'm about four miles from the museum, just off of Highway 180 there. And I always invite people that are interested in the, you know, native Navajo arts. I'm more than happy to share my place with them. Yeah, and I've been there. It's pretty fantastic. So just give me a call and tell me where I <laughs> tell me where I've seen you, and you're welcome to come yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to have some kind of reference there, though. We want yeah. the reference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Jam Musil. Thank, thank you again. All right. You're welcome. You bye bye. Fantastic.
Okay, it wasn't hard, right? No, it wasn't. You made me feel like you know it's super fun. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.